recording. This morning we're going to be looking at two poems. We're looking at Did I Miss Anything by Tom Whalen and The Second Coming by W.B. Yeats. These poems are both famous for different reasons. Did I Miss Anything is typically given out by college professors and teachers to students at the beginning of their semesters. Whereas The Second Coming by Yeats is just a famous poem in general. So let's start with the uh, Wayman poem. Did I miss anything? Let me read it first. Did I miss anything? Question frequently asked by students after missing a class. Nothing. When we realized you weren't here, we sat with our hands folded on our desks in silence for the full two hours. <laughs> Everything. I gave an exam worth 40% of the grade for this term and assigned some reading due today on which I'm about to hand out a quiz worth 50%. None of the content of this course has value or meaning. Take as many days off as you like. I, any activities we undertake as a class, I assure you, will not matter either to you or me and are without purpose. <laughs> Everything. A few minutes after we began last time, a shaft of light descended, and an angel or other heavenly being appeared and revealed to us what each woman or man must do to attain divine wisdom in this life and the hereafter. This is the last time this class will meet before we disperse to bring this good news to all people on the earth. Nothing. When you are not present, how could something significant occur? Everything contained within this classroom is a microcosm of human ex existence, assembled for you to query and examine and ponder this is not the only such place an opportunity has been gathered, but it was one place, and you weren't here. So right away we can tell that the tone of this poem, it, it alternates between sarcasm and bemusement. And more than anything else, if you get nothing else out of this lecture, I want you to remember the tone. So let's first of all talk about the title, Did I Miss Anything? Now you folks might not know it, but this is an inherently hostile question. If any student were to come up to any teacher and said, I missed yesterday's class, did I miss anything? This is always going to be interpreted badly. Because there are two possible answers to this question, yes and no. Whereas if you ask any teacher if you did anything in class yesterday, they're going to say yes, absolutely. The amount of time and effort that both teachers and college professors put into lectures is astounding. I don't think a lot of students get that. It's not just showing up and teaching, showing up and sitting at one's desk. It's more than that. It's about preparing the lesson that, this, that is going to be taught to the students. It's about, while they're lecturing, gauging students' interest. Are their eyes falling? Are they looking up at the ceiling? Are they getting bored? Are they getting it? Are they getting too much information? Is it not enough information? So the question itself is inherently hostile because it assumes that teachers do nothing. I mean, contrast, did I miss anything with what did I miss? The former assumes a negative, or at least allows for a negative, whereas the latter assumes a positive. Yes, you did miss something, here it is. The epigraph of the poem also sets the tone. This is the part right below the title where it's in italics. Now, this epigraph is it's not unique, but it's an interesting feature. Usually epigraphs in poems or in novels or in short stories reference other works of literature. <coughs> this one doesn't. Wayman came up with this epigraph himself, question frequently asked by students after missing a class. This indicates that this poem falls under the category of postmodernism. Instead of Wayman trying to write in a literary tradition, he is instead forging his own path. And self-made epigraphs are a feature of postmodern poetry. But for our purposes, it's important, because if we didn't have that epigraph, we wouldn't know what the response would be. We don't know what the rest of the poem would mean. So question frequently asked by students after missing a class. First stanza. Nothing. When we realized you weren't here, we sat with our hands folded on our desks in silence for the full two hours. 
If the question is hostile, then this first response is an answer to that hostility with a hostile answer of its own. What do we do? No, sorry. Did we miss anything? No, nothing. We sat at our desk with our hands folded. You didn't miss anything, buddy. It's a hostile answer to a hostile question. Now, this shows impulsivity on the case of the speaker, who we can assume is a teacher. Usually, a teacher won't do that. They will grit their teeth and they go, oh, he didn't mean it. He doesn't understand. This is what you missed. So this was a quick, brash response to this brash question that was posed in the title. Shows hostility. It shows impulsiveness. But after this first stanza, the rest of the poem becomes a lot more thoughtful. Look at the second stanza. Everything. I gave an exam worth 40% of the grade for this term and assigned some reading due today on which I'm about to hand out a quiz worth 50%. Some astute math majors in the audience might notice that 40 plus 50% doesn't equal 100%. This could be this could be the case for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's well known that English teachers have some disdain for mathematics. <laughs> this could be a purposeful rhetorical effect. The English teacher can't count, but English is still more important. On the other hand, it could also show, again, his impulsiveness. He is thinking, or she is thinking on the spot, posed with this hostile question, and comes up with this number off the top of his head, because he's not thinking clearly. 40%, 50%, 90%. It's also odd because you've got the exam worth 40% and you've got the poll, oh, I'm sorry, you've got the quiz worth 50%. Usually those are inverted. Exams are usually worth more than quizzes. So this again shows the impulsiveness of the speaker. But then when you get to the third stanza, you've got nothing. None of the content of this course has value or meaning. Take as many days off as you like. Any activities we undertake as a class, I assure you, will not matter either to you or me and are without purpose. So we're moving from an academic response and the hostile response in the first stanza to a more philosophical response. Nothing in this course has value or meaning. These are two different concepts. Some students don't value the course. They maybe miss a lot of classes or they come to class and they talk a lot. They might not value the course. That doesn't mean that the course is without meaning. There's lots to learn and discover in school and at university. So value and meaning are two opposite, not opposite, but they're two complementary words here. They shouldn't be taken as the same because they are quite different. But if a student comes to class and say, says, did I miss anything yesterday? He's assuming that it was without value. He's maybe asking the question because he wants to look like a good student, and he's just not thinking about what he's saying, or maybe he was told by his mom to go ask, what did you miss yesterday, find out from your teacher, or maybe he heard about a quiz or a test. But he's not asking about the meaning. So value, did I miss anything? Meaning, what did I miss? What did I miss? This question implies that the class did have value, and the student wants to know the meaning that was missed. So, hostile, academic, philosophical. If the fourth stanza then has obvious religious connotations, everything a few minutes after we began last time, a shaft of light descended and an angel or other heavenly being appeared and revealed to us what each woman or man must do to obtain divine wisdom in this life and hereafter. This is the last class we will meet before we disperse to bring the good news to all people on earth. So we have these very specific terms that are actually from the Bible. Good news to all people on earth. This is Luke 2.10. When the angels descend from the heavens to the shepherds and say, Look, Christ is born. Go and see him. I have good news for all peoples. So Wayman is mocking the speaker now. He's saying that the content of his class is equivalent to a religious epiphany. And then we have the angel descending, we have divine wisdom, we have the idea of dispersing to bring good news, like early missionaries and missionaries today. He's mocking. He's mocking the person who's asking this question. And the question in my mind is, does the student understand that he or she is being mocked? Or is like, uh, what? Angels? 
So we, again, we've got this cynicism, this hostility. The fifth stanza is even deeper. Nothing. When you are not present, how could something significant occur? This is almost like a Zen cone, a Zen riddle. If you are not present, how could something significant occur? This is very similar to that old adage, if a tree falls in the forest, nobody hears it, does it make a sound? If a student is not here, do they learn anything? Is there anything of value? So we have this spiritual counterpoint to the religious content in the fourth stanza. And then in stanza six, everything contained in this classroom is a microcosm of human ex existence, assembled for you to query and examine and ponder. This is not the only such place. An opportunity has been gathered, but it was one place. This isn't as deep as stanzas two through four. This is a scientific answer. The classroom is our place of study. We were studying the universe and meaning. Again, meaning. We were studying meaning here. So we've got these scientific terms, microcosm, assemble, query, examine, <coughs> ponder. Scientific words, as opposed to the spiritual or the philosophical or the religious words that were used in previous dances. And then you've got this ending, and you weren't here. It's unflinchingly sarcastic. It's unflinchingly cynical. This teacher is obviously not happy with the question. And notice that these are different answers. It's not like a teacher is going to respond with everything, nothing, everything, nothing, everything, nothing at the same time. These are different ways, perhaps, that a teacher or professor could approach this question. And notice how it flips between everything, nothing, everything, nothing, everything, nothing. What did you miss? Everything. What did you miss? Nothing. These are obvious exaggerations. Obviously, this is hyperbole. It's not like somebody could miss everything, everything in a course, in one day. It's not like they missed nothing. If, if, if the student were to miss nothing, the class before, what would that mean? That would mean that we were sitting around doing nothing? Using Facebook and chatting? Obviously, that would never happen in a classroom. <laughs> so there needs to be a, this question, this response. It's obviously sarcastic, obviously cynical. Now, what I'm going to do is, I, this is these are my notes, these are my annotations. On the bottom of this, I've got a link to uh, Wayman's own interpretation of the poem. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to scan this, and I'll put it up on the website someplace that you can take a look. And then you can go through and you can read what Wayman himself says about the poem. Now, in this poem, I see not only cynicism, but bemusement. The teacher is amused by this question, or else they wouldn't think of all these answers. They wouldn't think of these different ways to approach this. Wayman himself says that this poem was born out of bitterness and anger. This is an angry poem from his perspective. But the way poetry works is once it's on the page, and once we read it, we can interpret it the way that we like. This is my interpretation. Some of this is his. I agree with him in some points. But I do see the bemusement and the amusement present in this poem that he doesn't seem to acknowledge. Anyway, I'll leave that up to you to take a look at that if you're interested. Second poem, The Second Coming by W.B. We Eats. Let me read this. <coughs> turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart, the center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood dim tide is loosed, and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Surely some revelation is at hand. Surely the second coming is at hand. The second coming. Hardly are those words out when a vast image out of spiritus mundi troubles my sight. A waste of desert sand. A shape with lion body and the head of a man. A gaze blank and pitiless as the sun is moving its slow thighs while all about it wind shadows of the indignant desert birds. The darkness drops again. But now I know that twenty centuries of stony sleep were vexed to nightmare by a rocking cradle. And what rough beast, its hour come at last, 
slouches towards Bethlehem to be born. This is an extremely famous poem because it is so evocative. The imagery in this poem is very deep and very rich. So let's start at the beginning. The three lions here at the beginning, turning and turning in the widening gyre. The falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart the center cannot hold. These are incredibly famous lines. Chinua Achebe wrote a book called Things Fall Apart, referencing this. In fact, there are several book titles that use lines from this poem alone in their titles. Slouching Towards Bethlehem, reference the last line as a collection of essays that was written sometime in the 60s. There's other examples. I'm not going to go through all of them right now. But to let you know how important and influential this poem is, people have taken chunks of this poem and made it the title for their own works. Hugely influential. So Yeats is talking about his own view of history. And what he believed was that history um, is unfolding in what he calls gyres, so cycles. He believes that the last cycle was started with the birth of Christ, and this ushered in a new, a golden age for our world. And it's been getting steadily worse. And he believed that about 2,000 years after the birth of Christ, there would be a new gyre, a new cycle of destruction and of darkness. Now one of the reasons that he thought this was because he wrote this poem, he lived through World War I, he lived through the Troubles, the Irish Troubles, and he wrote this poem as a response to what he saw as the negativity in this world. World War I was a huge event. Nothing like this had happened in the world before. A global war, and for a lot of people, who had just lived through World War I, it was an apocalyptic event. I mean, this is not, I mean, World War II hadn't even happened. Even worse, with the Holocaust. But you need to think of World War I by itself, and Yeats was alternately fascinated and horrified by it. He was worried about what was to come. And so he thought that this cycle was ending. And this isn't the only poem that he wrote about this. He also wrote in The Magi, On Women, The Phases of the Moon, Solomon and the Witch, Easter 1916, A Vision, Demon and Beast, The Wild Swans, and through all these reference in some way, his apocalyptic vision. He wasn't just a poet. He was a self-styled prophet. He actually believed this. And this is different from other poetry. For instance, Sylvia Plath's daddy. She didn't actually believe that her father was a Nazi. She didn't. She's using the imagery to represent her father. But in this poem, Yeats actually believes this. The image in the second stanza, a vast image out of Spiritus Mundi. This is the soul of the world, the world's soul. This is a quasi Jungian concept of the collective unconscious. When we all dream, according to Jung, we share this collective mind, and all of these archetypal images come out of this collective world spirit, as Yeats would say. When a vast image troubles my sight, a waste of desert sand, a shape with lion body and the head of a man, a blank gaze, the pitiless as the sun. He's talking about a sphinx or a manticore. So we've got this image from Egypt, and this fits because we're also talking about Bethlehem, which is also in the Middle East. So this sphinx, this image of destruction, comes out of the sand and slowly moves its way towards Bethlehem. Bethlehem is where Christ is born. So Yeats is referencing Bethlehem as the place where the gyre both started and ended. This image is powerful. He actually had this vision. He, in the corner, and he talks about this in the preface to one of his plays. In the corner of his mind, he saw this creature laughing at him. And he was disturbed, he was troubled by it. And he couldn't stop writing about it in his poems. So, let's back up to the first stanza at the very end. We were talking about the negativity, about how he saw the world falling apart. The last two lines, the best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passion and intensity. Notice the inversion here. The good people have no more energy. The bad people are the ones who are energetic. So everything is getting turned around, switched around. Throughout this entire poem, we have these images of movement, of not just movement, but of cyclical movement. 
He considers history to be cyclical. Birth of Christ, goods, coming down to the end of this gyre. And then, supposedly, thousands of years later, it's going to go back up again. But you've got that wave function. You've got the idea of the, um, of the, falcon, or the falcon turning and turning. So again, that's spinning. You've got the idea of the center cannot hold. So thinking of a center that's just wildly going off axis. You've got the idea of the tide, again, cyclical, in, out, in, out. Uh, shadows winding around, the, the, I'm sorry, the desert birds winding around the Sphinx. You've got the cradle rocking back and forth. All of these images, it's a wave function. This is what he's referencing here. This is his view of history, and this is the imagery that he's embedding throughout this entire poem. There aren't very image. There aren't very many words of movement in this poem that don't reference this wave, that don't reference this back and forth. So in the second stanza, when he's talking about his vision, we've got surely some revelation, some second coming. These are all Christian words. It's important to note, though, that in his first draft, he didn't use the word second coming, he used the word second birth. But in revision, he decided to change it to second coming. So we've got this, this double entente. We've got the Christian second coming, Christ coming back, everything's great. And we've got the second coming of this beast. This beast is coming out of the earth and it's going to destroy everything. It's an image of destruction. Then we've got the third stanza. So the vision drops. He has a revelation about what's happened in this vision. The darkness drops again, but now I know that 20 centuries of stony sleep were vexed to nightmare by a rocking cradle. This is a reference to Christ. They were vexed to sleep by a rocking cradle. In the Bible, in the New Testament, it talks about how Christ was laid in a manger, which is, as we know, it's pigsty. It's where pigs eat. This is what a manger actually is. But over the years, a manger has taken on the meaning of cradle. And then, of course, because we're talking about Bethlehem at the very end, it's obviously a reference to Christ. So instead of the, the good gyre, the good era being born out of Christ, we've got a new, terrible era being born out of the same place. It's our come round at last. So in, um, in Yeats' own words, he talks about these two different eras as the primary era, the one from zero to about 2000, or whenever this event of destruction will happen, and then the antithetical era. So the primary era in his words are dogmatic, leveling, unifying, feminine, humane, and peaceful. Whereas the antithetical era, era he describes as expressive, hierarchical, multiple, masculine, harsh, and surgical. We're not exactly sure when this gyre will end according to Yeats. He's talking about 20 centuries, so 2000 years. This could be a rough estimate. In 1925, he said that this destruction, or this next revelation, we're not sure, might not occur for another 200 years. So it's possible that in 200 years, this destruction will take place, according to Yeats. This is what Yeats is saying. So, <clears throat> we've got these two poems, wildly different in tone. Wayman's poem is very cynical and sort of bemused. Yeats is very serious with this very apocalyptic and moving imagery within it. Two different poems. That's it.